Thank you for being here. This is the first lecture in the My Missouri Lecture Series. I'm Gary Kramer, the Executive Director of the State Historical Society of Missouri. We began planning for this new series over the past year as a way to invite prominent Missourians from all walks of life to reflect upon what being a Missourian has meant to them. This really comes from my own rereading some time back of Hector de Saint Crivecourt's uh, comments on his visit to America in the late 18th century, where he posed the question What is this American? What is this new American? And so the question I'm posing is What is this Missourian? Is there a Missouri character? I know there are Missouri characters. Um, as part of the mission of the State Historical Society of Missouri, we hope to learn and share how the state's history, its people, and its culture have shaped the experiences of all Missourians, including prominent Missourians. We are deeply honored that Senator Claire McCaskill, whose papers we recently took, has said, uh, said yes to us when we ask her to speak today. Uh, here to introduce Senator McCaskill is society trustee and second vice president. For 14 years, he was third vice president, uh, but we moved him up a notch. Uh, Missouri senior United States Senator, the Honorable White Blunt. Well, thank you, Gary. I'm glad to be here. I'm really glad to be the second vice president after 14 years as uh, the third vice president. I feel like I'm skyrocketing to the top. And uh, Hank Waters is the fourth vice president now, moved all the way from fifth vice president today. But when Gary uh, and I were talking a couple of months ago, he said that uh, Claire was going to give this speech. I said, well, I'd love to introduce her. So I, I asked for this assignment, and uh, now that we've heralded my rise to second vice president, I'll take the Senate admonition, which should be when you're introducing somebody, you should talk more about them than you. And I'm going to try to do that. I may not get that done as much as I would like to, but if I did that, anybody could give this introduction. Um, I know Claire pretty well. And I'm glad to get to do this. So 35 years ago this spring, this coming spring, I remember one morning, I think it was the first time I ever actually visited with Claire about a governmental matter. I walked into her office in the first floor of the, of the Missouri Capitol. She was a state representative. I was the new secretary of state. They'd had a meeting the night before to deal with my request for some branch offices. Wanted three, Kansas City, Springfield, St. Louis. I got one, St. Louis. And somebody said, you know, Claire McCaskill was really the most concerned about you having this other office. So I walked in and said, I understand you were concerned. I'm, I think these are going to work. I'll try to keep you uh, updated over the next year and see what happens. And the next year, there was a Kansas City office, and Claire had been watching, and she was for it. So 35 years ago, Joe... Shepard and I have been friends for 40 years. Um, Abby and I don't go out to dinner very much in Washington, but if we do go out to dinner, we would just as soon go with, with Claire and Joe as anybody. In fact, we probably have gone to dinner with them more than anybody. Um, so I've known Claire for a while, but the really the eight years we got to work together in the Senate, are the eight years where we worked together every day. Now, we certainly didn't always agree every day. In fact, there were weeks when we didn't agree on anything on any day, but uh, our relationship, interestingly to me, was a relationship from almost day one with no pretense. We were very open with each other, things that didn't need to be discussed. We knew what they were, uh, where I was going to be and where she was going to be. We often knew where that was as well. But let's go back just a little bit. This is kind of like revisiting the campaign commercials. Claire, born in Houston, Missouri, and then moved to Lebanon. Her dad went into the insurance business there, and then he became the state insurance commissioner, and they moved to Columbia. So it's Columbia for high school and Columbia MU for college and MU for law school, and then... The General Assembly, not too long after 
that, uh, and then the Jackson County Prosecutor's Office, and after that, the State Auditor's Office, and after that, the United States Senate. Um, and, I, and all those things happen. We talked about this not too long ago. We were having breakfast there, and I remember we talked about this not too long ago. All those things happened at a time, and I think they all required a degree of connectedness that is not necessarily required now. Um, got to talking about politics over at our table, and I said, um, you know, when I was first elected statewide office, that was 1984. Uh, Jim Kirkpatrick asked me how much money I spent, and I said, well, $350,000. He said, well, that's 10 times more than I ever spent. And I said, well, I was just 10 times as hard to elect as you ever <laughs> were. And, you know, that's $350,000 is not even starting money for a state rep race these days. And I think when you were doing politics that way, you just developed relationships that were deeper and more committed and more and more um, lasting than maybe they might be in our current politics. So Claire, her politics were that as well. You know, when you think about, when I think about her, really she defined in so many ways by uh, her family and continues to be, uh, her sisters who look enough like her that they have ridden in more than one parade as if they were Claire McCaskill, which allowed Claire to be more places than Claire could possibly be. Her mom, an absolute force of nature. So I get elected to the Senate. Joe and, and uh, Betty McCaskill are having lunch in the Senate dining room. Abby and I are there. I think it's the first day. And so I said, we need to go over and see, uh, see Joe and, uh, and Claire's mom. And I walk over, and this is the first day I'm in the Senate, and Claire's mom said, well... I'd like to be able to tell you I'm glad to see you here, but I'd be being two-faced. <laughs> a classic Betty McCaskill moment. And so our time together began. And, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, it turned out to be, in so many ways, some of the most political and most uncomfortable times uh, in at least my political lifetime. But we talked almost... Uh, every day. We were on the Commerce Committee together. We Somehow the way it worked out, we were almost always back-to-back -back questioners. I was much more likely to give some historical analogy of the moment we were in or what we were facing. Claire was much more likely to talk about her cable TV bill. Sometimes with comedy, sometimes with just pure outrage. And it was almost always more effective than me talking about something that wasn't the cable uh, TV bill. Uh, on the big national issues, we didn't agree, but uh, on the things that kept the government open, we almost always agreed. And on the things that impacted Missouri, we did always agree. You'd have to really fight hard to find a time and look hard to find a time when we didn't. Uh, and not only would we always agree, but if it was somewhere in Missouri, we both knew where it was. And we both knew the town that was next door. And one of us knew who the county sheriff was or who needed to be uh, called. Uh, and um, it, was a, uh, it was a unique opportunity for me. So, you know, Claire, how, how you can be that smart and that insightful and so often wrong. I've always been, <laughs> I've always wondered about that. I, I watch Morning Joe for about 10 minutes every day. I watch it longer if Claire is on, and she is always the most rational person on Morning Joe if she is on. That's not a very high bar, by the way, <laughs> to be the most rational person on Morning Joe. But let me get to the high bar. The high bar that Claire really does get to is daughter, sister, wife, mom, grandmother, um, and uniquely the, the, the 
process that only a few people have been able to have. I think she uniquely understands our state, and I'm glad to get to introduce her, Claire McCaskill. Thank you. There's some Morning Joe fans here, obviously. Thank you very much. It's very kind of you. I uh, thank everyone for this, especially the Missouri Historical Society, for this special invitation. And I want to thank my dear friend Roy for that introduction. But I, I have to give you the rest of the story that he told about the first time we actually met. I certainly obviously knew who he was. He'd run for Secretary of State back in the days that Republicans weren't allowed to be Secretary of State. And uh, he won. And um, I was aware of him because he left out the part that his father and my mother ran against each other for state representative uh, down in southwest Missouri. Now, if you knew my mother, and many of you did well, uh, especially Hank Waters, you would know that she loved a windmill she could jo joust at, and she loved um, fighting when there was no chance of winning, and that's kind of what that state rep race was. She was in a very conservative part of the state, and as you all know, Mom was not conservative. I mean, Dan Veets will tell you as he uh, tried to get her to lead the march on the Vietnam War that um, Mom was certainly more liberal than um, the folks in southwest Missouri. So I knew who he was. Um, but what you need to understand about why he came to my office that morning, he was kind to me. The night before, I had um, railed against an appropriation that was going to Bill Webster and Roy Blunt for branch offices. And call me silly or cynical at an early young age, but I saw an encroachment into the parts of the state that were heavily Democratic. And I could just see the public service announcements by Bill Webster and, and, and Roy Blunt about how great service they're providing. And I saw this, and then I also found out that behind the scenes, there were some shenanigans going on between a guy named Tony Roboto and Bill Griffin, Bob Griffin rather, how quickly I forget, Bob Griffin, about getting jobs in particularly Webster's office. Those of you that remember Bill Webster, he had a very powerful father by the name of Dick Webster, who was in the state Senate, who ruled everything. And Dick Webster had cut a deal to give some of the jobs in Kansas City and St. Louis. I don't think Roy was any part of this, to tell you the truth. This was really kind of a Dick Webster special. And um, we kind of found out about it, and I wanted to put a stop to it. And the leadership had lied to me about it, which was infuriating to me. So I had really um, railed at this meeting about um, nepotism and this was a political deal and blah, blah, blah. I, I would, you know, I was young and thought I knew everything. And um, so the next morning, two things happened. The first thing that happened was Roy Blunt showed up in my door himself, quietly, without fanfare, no entourage, no posse, no staff. Just came in and said, can I visit with you a minute? And he sat there and he explained very cogently why he needed an office in Kansas City and that they were serving corporations and the vast majority of the corporations were in Kansas City and St. Louis and how it made sense. I thought, hmm, that's interesting. I was nice. I said, you know, I'll think about it. He left. About 20 minutes later, a young man that was younger than I was, and I think I was 28 at the time, um, appeared in my doorway. He said, I have a message for you. It's from Dick Webster, Senator Dick Webster. Every piece of legislation you touch is dead. It will not pass. It has no chance of passage. And if you have any questions, don't bother to call him because he will not speak to you. That was my introduction to someone who wielded power like a two by four and someone who had finesse and understood that power with a velvet glove usually ends up being much more powerful. And that was my friend, Roy Blunt. Um, and I am proud that we're friends. I am proud that I can shout it louder than I could before. He still has a problem with that. <laughs> He's gotta be a little careful uh, admitting to people what close friends we are. You know, you're dangerously old when you get asked to speak somewhere and they say, we want you to talk about your life and history. Uh, I, I, was, I was a little worried about that. Uh, first, let me share with you um, what so many of you have been kind, and I have so many dear friends, the kind of connections you talk about, Roy. There's a bunch of them for me in this room. 
Um, first of all, I'm very happy. I am so happy I feel guilty. Uh, I, am, I am finding myself, you know, I labored in the public sector for my entire adult life. From the moment I graduated uh, from law school here on this campus until a few months ago, I was in the public sector. It was glorious. It was exciting. It was challenging. It was wonderful. But I've discovered freedom. I've discovered the ability to control my own schedule. These are glorious things. And I am extremely happy. There's a life out here. Uh, only in America can I get paid for talking about politics. And mostly just whenever I feel like it. And I'm getting paid real money to do that. I'm in New York 10 to 15 days a month working for NBC, and it's amazing. I don't think I could live there 100% of the time because I'm a Missouri girl, but half the time, it's sweet. And you know, Roy, when I get off work in New York, I, unlike DC, I'm not required to go to a fundraiser. And I don't have to go to a cocktail party to visit with groups that are visiting from Missouri. I can go to a museum. I can go listen to jazz. And I can indulge one of my lifelong passions, uh, that is my love of Broadway. I'm also busy working on a project um, here at the university uh, that both educated me and both my parents. And it is our beloved Mizzou. And uh, stay tuned for that, because I will we'll be busy trying to help with a project right here at our university. It is a little awkward for me to spend 30 minutes talking about myself since I no longer run for office. It's funny, once you're no longer running for office, you feel a little more compunction about making it all about yourself. So I thought I'd tell you a Missouri story, a story rich with characters and infused with Missouri values. What does my family history, my Missouri history, contribute to my life? It is all about Missouri values. Born out of hardship, conflict, compromise, and community. These are small town values that I've carried in my pocket all of my life, many times not appreciating how they forged my success and helped me learn through failure. I want to tell you about a week in the life of my grandparents when I was a small child, when I was being influenced every day by what my family was modeling for me. Now, I'm in Columbia. You might expect this story to be about my mom or my dad, who loved this community and were active in this community, or my childhood here. But it really is about my grandmother, Mildred Harlan Ward. Uh, both my mom's family and my dad's family were multi-generational Missouri families. M many of their ancestors settled communities in the Ozarks. My grandmother was a single mother when good folks didn't have that happen. She married a drinker and a gambler from a nice family in Tennessee. He took her out to California. She had two small children, and she eventually left him and moved back to Lebanon, Missouri, a small town many of you are familiar with, very near Bennett Springs, of about 6,000 people. She moved in with her sister and her sister's husband, Tom and Betty Connor, and they never moved out. They were a non-traditional family before non-traditional families were very common in a very small town. Tom and Betty Connor and Betty's sister, my grandmother Mildred, and Mildred and her two children, my mother and her brother, all lived together in Lebanon. They made a household. As a child, I didn't realize how strange and unusual they were. I just figured I was lucky to have five grandparents. But the life of Tom, Betty, and Mildred reflected Missouri values. When I was a small child, they lived in a very small two-bedroom house. Their kitchen was the size of a broom closet. Tom and Betty owned and ran the small corner drugstore right off the main street of Lebanon, which they opened early and closed late every day but Sunday. They had one employee. It was mostly just the two of them. Tom filled prescriptions, worked the cash register, 
and helped make milkshakes behind the lunch counter when it got busy. Betty stocked and sold over-the-counter medication and beauty products, worked the cash register, and handled the very busy lunch counter making sandwiches and flipping burgers on the grill. My grandmother, Mildred, landed a full-time job as a secretary in the local state unemployment office. She worked there for 25 years, every day doing piping, administrative work, and calling people who were unemployed, trying to help them find work. They worked hard making a living. But wait, there was more. They were active in town. Clubs, card games, civic projects. Tom was a deacon at the church. My grandmother was the church organist who played the organ in church every Sunday for all of her adult life. Even when she was so ill and so riddled with arthritis in her hands, I remember watching as a young girl as she played the organ, tears coming down her face from the pain that she felt when she played the organ. There were weekly choir practices. There were funerals and weddings to play. There were meetings to go to. But that even wasn't all. Because you see, every night, these two strong, tiny women, neither one of them are five feet tall, they stood shoulder to shoulder in that tiny kitchen and made the next day's lunch to be sold at the drugstore. Chicken salad, tuna salad, sandwich loaf, and the daily special. On my grandmother's one day off on Saturday, because she always would scold me when I said Sunday was a day off, I said, no, that's a very important day, Claire. It's not a day off. On her one day off, she baked bread all day in that tiny kitchen while Beppy and Tom were at the drugstore. Then came Sunday, Sunday school and church. Afterward, they prepared a big meal for our whole family, and we gathered around a very crowded table in a very crowded room and feasted on their talents, being lectured about humility and good manners and discussing world events. And several of them were big Republicans, and my mother was certainly not. So they were real family discussions. Somebody asked me one time, why are all of you so loud? And I said, well, you had to be there. <laughs> but after that exhausting week, you would think my grandmother, after this lunch, would put her feet up and rest for a few hours before facing another week. But no, no, not my grandmother. She got in her car, and by the way, she refused to drive anything but a stick shift, and delivered those loaves of bread to all the people in the church who were sick, to people in the community that were her friends that were struggling or having personal problems. That was the life they lived. I had no idea at the time how hard they were working, but I do now. And I'm so blessed by their Missouri values. Hard work, community, family. There is a sharing of those values in our great state. Mine stem from rural Missouri, but they're no different in St. Louis and Kansas City. The biggest danger in our state today is the failure for us all to recognize our shared values a growing sense that we don't have the same value. I've watched this creep into our daily lives and unfortunately into our politics. As we all know, Missourians have bridged differences of opinions from the very start of our state. It is of note these days that we remember that it was quote unquote a compromise that brought us into the union almost two centuries ago. And yet Missouri's struggle to get in ultimately drove our nation to war. We cannot forget that part of the outcome either. In many ways, the conflicts from then are not completely resolved, the wounds still festering. But what Missourians have always done from early on is figuring out how to live in that middle ground. During the Civil War, it was finding the middle ground living between the North and the South. They had to figure out how that could work. 
We are still figuring out what the middle ground means today, racially, religiously, and economically. Some might deem Missouri's struggle today a rural-urban divide. And yet, when we really drill down, urban and rural communities share the same values, the same problems, and the same priorities. In 2018, the Pew Research Center did a study about what unites and divides urban and rural communities. While that same study confirmed the widening divide on social and political issues, it also found this divide did not extend to how people experienced life in their different communities. The study found whether urban or rural, when it comes to how people live their day-to-day -day lives, their values are very similar. People feel attached to their communities, with nearly half living where they, near where they grew up. 47% of rural residents and 42% of urban live in or near where they grew up. Family ties is what kept them there or brought them back. Family ties was the most important reason given why someone never left the farm or the city neighborhood or why they moved back after living away. Quoting from an article about the study, in the Pew data, remarkably similar shares of urban and rural respondents say they feel attached to their communities, have face-to-face -face conversations with their neighbors, and value being near their families. They differ on questions about the harms or benefits of immigration and whether whites have advantages in society that African Americans don't. But they're nearly identical in their concerns about poverty, jobs, and drug addiction. And they report almost identical levels of economic insecurity. Despite these similarities, we are reaching a point in our state where the differences that we let divide us could become stronger than the values that bring us together. We are now embracing such a virulent form of tribalism, we cannot even agree on the facts. Hard work, community, family, these are my Missouri values. And I'm betting that they are also yours. We cannot lose sight of that in a rush to judge our neighbors or demonize those who think differently than we do. We cannot let the abrasive and damaging political differences do permanent damage to the state we love. We must stand strong for some old-fashioned values called moderation and compromise. We cannot let the extremes on both sides tear us apart in the middle. We must lean hard on our shared values to find that common ground. We must rely on our values to knit us back together. Our very own Missouri made President Truman put it best. It is understanding that gives us an ability to have peace. When we understand the other fellow's viewpoint and he understands ours, then we can sit down and work out our differences. Or as another one of my favorite presidents said, Obama, the forces that divide us are not as strong as the forces that unite us. I pray that is still true. I urge you all to talk to someone you disagree with this week. Thank you very much. We have people running for president that are promoting a, a, a radical socialist agenda of infanticide, reparations, gun confiscation, Medicare for all, uh, partially funded by uh, granting citizenship, 15 million illegals. Uh, it appears to me the Democratic Party has a death wish. Uh, could you comment on why, what's happened to the Democratic Party? Uh, well, I'm, I'm tempted to say what happened to you, Chris. <laughs> um, <laughs> I... Um, We've always had extreme elements in our party. And Harry Truman was considered pretty damn extreme. As you know, he was for universal health care. Uh, that was one of his primary tenets when he was running for president. Uh, we are the party that fought the, de the de 
declaration that we were socialists when we did Medicare, when we did Social Security. Uh, I think we have always been the party that has tried um, to, uh, you know, do the things to help the most vulnerable. Are there some people running for president that are saying things I disagree with? Yee howdy, yeah, there are. Um, but at the end of the day, um, and I don't want to go foot too far down this rabbit hole because this is not a lunch about politics. At the end of the day, the American people are going to have a binary choice. And I think that binary choice is going to be stark. I don't think it's, you know, I mean, we've got a president now who, um, after I just said all this about being kind, um, I, I, I want to be careful, but um, it, it, yeah, it only lasts so long, right, Roy? I can only do it for about 15 minutes, and then mom comes out. Um, so I, I, I am not as pessimistic as you are. There are a whole lot of Democrats that see the world like I do, which is gun safety it has nothing to do with whether or not you believe in the Second Amendment. Um, that figuring out a way to make health care more accessible and affordable should always be a center plank of our party. So I believe that you will end up with a candidate who is closer to the middle than to the edge in our party. And then this country will have a very, I think, defining moment as to whether or not we're going to go back to a president who has some more normal behavior as it relates to how you handle the responsibilities of the most powerful office in the world. I wanted to ask a pretty easy question. Uh, when you started out in politics, now you're looking backward, you're looking at your own history. What do you wish you knew then that you know now? Um, it's a great question. I wish I um, developed tougher skin sooner. I mean, there were way too many times I was crying in my office in the state capitol as a young state representative. Uh, I wasn't, my skin wasn't thick enough. I took things way too personally. Um, it's hard when you decide you are going to embark upon a career where the entire premise of your career is whether or not you're going to be accepted or rejected publicly. And um, obviously, those of us who do it crave that acceptance, right? We want to be accepted, and uh, we want to be liked. So navigating the desire to be liked with the desire to cast the vote that you must cast uh, because of what your principal beliefs are was much harder for me earlier in my career than it was later in my career. So I think I learned that. And I, I'll tell you what I treasure now. Roy is right. I am feel so blessed that I grew up in a time where I knew who the Democratic chairman was in Polk County, uh, that I even knew where Polk County was. Um, I'm blessed that when I campaigned statewide for the first time, it actually meant you went statewide. Um, I'm blessed that I had roots all over this state and made dear friends that I draw on now. I do think that um, the most recent election, statewide election in Missouri, and like Roy, who spent $300,000, um, I think the grand total of the last, this, the, my last election, the election I lost, I think the grand total was somewhere around $300 million for that Senate race. And um, I, I really do honestly believe that while there were many things that could speak in favor of Josh Hawley, I guarantee you he hasn't stepped foot in the vast majority of the counties in this state. He could do that now. Uh, you really couldn't do that when you, in 1998 when you're running for state auditor, driving yourself all over the state because you didn't have enough money to have a staff. That was really not what you could do. So there were long trips on lonely highways, getting to one county to the other. And I feel lucky that I got to participate at pol in politics when it was like that. Um, because I think the, this room is testimony to it. The friendships I have in this room, I wouldn't trade for anything, not even another term in the state, in the United States Senate. Thank you so much for sharing that beautiful Missouri history and your history. Um, and identify particularly because I grew up in a drugstore in Boonville, Missouri. Um, and my parents always said, I wonder if you would comment on, they were so glad they got out when they did, because what are some of the reasons you can't make a living doing that? 
Yeah, uh, my, my, um, uh, he was like my grandfather. He was technically my great uncle, but Uncle Tom, uh, Connor Drugstore, uh, was put out of business by one thing. And I'll never forget it. His heart broke over it because, you know, it was a gathering spot. Everybody came there for coffee before they went to work. Everybody came there for lunch downtown. Uh, I overheard a lot of interesting conversations hanging out around the lunch counter at Connor Drug as a child. Uh, it was Walmart. Um, when Walmart came to town, Tom told me that they were selling Bayer aspirin cheap, more cheaply at Walmart than he could buy it. So he was faced with the fact that if he was going to try to compete with them, he had to go out and buy it from them and then hope the people that were coming for coffee would buy aspirin while they were there because they needed it. And obviously, that's a business model that doesn't work. They couldn't sustain the drugstore on the lunch counter. And like many corner drugstores across Missouri, um, I, I don't, it, it, there's maybe a few. I think Ken McLean helped try to save a, 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 counter, a, a counter service on the square in Independence where Harry Truman used to go and get a phosphate. Um, but those, that's part of our Missouri history that has disappeared because of technology and the modernization of retail in this country. And it's sad, but I'm sure that's probably why that, your parents' drugstore is not there anymore either. Well, I'm Hank. She's referred to me as time or two, uh, and thankfully in a kind of a moderate tone. She is a moderate. She can We've heard a lot about uh, some fairly important political figures in American life here today. The real force of nature that kind of lurks in a serious way behind Claire's life and career is Betty McCaskill. Betty McCaskill, her mother, was my dear friend, and I would hear every time something happened that she thought was not quite fair to Betty. <laughs> To Claire, she would make sure I heard about it before the ink was dry. And I, I will not admit to being influenced by a, an outspoken member of the public, but you don't resist Betty McCaskill that easily. So I was just wondering if you'd want to say a few more things about the influence that Betty, when she was on the Columbia City Council, she, you must have learned something about public life during that time. Yeah, when she was on the city council here in Columbia, she was the first woman ever elected to the city council in Columbia. And it was a, a banner year in Columbia. Those of you that were around, Dan might remember this and others might remember this. It was the very first time that a professor, Clyde Wilson, had gotten elected to the city council. So, you know, there were invaders. The business community was not comfortable that there is this flame throwing woman who, whenever they'd go into closed session, you know, there were about 14 journalists for every member of the council, right, because of the school. And when they would go into a closed session and they'd begin talking about something that should not have been in the closed session, well, mom would walk out of the meeting in the hallway going, they're doing it again. <laughs> they're in there talking about stuff you guys should hear. And um, I found it terribly embarrassing, all of her stuff. When, because I was in high school and it just wasn't cool and she was embarrassing. But boy, oh boy, did she role model for me guts. You know, and at the end of the day, um, these jobs are really a pain in the ass if you can't move the needle on things you care about. If it's just about staying in office, I won't name names, but you probably can think of some. Ones who have managed very effectively to stay in office in Missouri without ever, you know, shaking the tree, so to speak. Mom, um, when she was still alive, and I'm so glad she lived to see me in the Senate, uh, she would, you know, do to me what she did to you, Hank. She would call me and say, are you my daughter? What are you being so mealy-mouthed about? Just say it, goddammit, just say it. So when you have that kind of mother, it, it probably means you're always going to be slightly controversial as a, as, a, as a politician. Which office was your favorite? I got to be honest with you, um, probably Jackson County Prosecutor. It was, a, it was coming together of um, two or three things. I mean, don't get me wrong. 
I learned to love the auditor's office because I could go poke around and cause trouble wherever I felt like it. And, you know, the United States Senate is an incredible honor and really smart people. And you've got to cover the waterfront in terms of issues. And for a policy wonk like me, I mean, that was like, you know, 50 pounds of dark chocolate. So I, I but the prosecutor's office, when I took that job as the boss, um, there had never been a woman do that. And when I went to work as an assistant prosecutor in Kansas City, I was the only woman in the office. So to take over as the boss and then have the ability to do things like drug court, which was way out of the box in 1994, when we began the first, one of the first drug courts in the country. It is now, they are as common as weeds in August. But then they were really something different. And to be able to do that, to be able to do uh, not just community policing, but community prosecution, uh, to be able to get in the courtroom and just rail on some of the worst human beings that God has put on this planet, and to, to find righteous vindication, vindication for victims uh, that had been treated terribly by people who call themselves human beings, and to be surrounded by people who are willing to jump off cliffs uh, to, to do the right thing, the sense of community and collegiality around the office, that we were all engaged in something that was meaningful, whether it was taking care of victims, putting bad guys in jail, or figuring out how to do better in communities in terms of, that was really fun. And the fact that I could pick any file I wanted and go into court, that really was fun. Um, it, most prosecutors don't try cases. I miss trying cases. I'll tell you a funny story about that. As, I, um, as my kids got older, I was no longer a prosecutor, and they were not old enough to remember, really, when I was a prosecutor. And so one time, we were sitting around. This is when I was a single mom. And the four of us were watching TV, and we were watching Law & Order. And I, my kids were probably 9, 7, and 5 at the time. Okay, and something happened on Law and Order, and as the lawyers in the room will tell you, often it is ter terribly unrealistic. And cases are never that exciting, and uh, but you know something happened. I go, that is not right. That would never happen. And my daughter Maddie goes, well, how would you know? <laughs> and I go, well, Maddie, I actually did that. And she goes, no, you didn't. And I go, no, no, I, yes, I really did. So they frankly don't believe that I actually went toe to toe with juries. So um, I look back on that time as a time when we were really beginning to look at crime in Kansas City as a public health issue, especially drugs, and try to be more holistic in the way we looked at some of the problems facing the criminal justice system. So I have to admit, um, Mel Carnahan was a very persuasive guy to talk me out of that job and, and getting me to run for auditor. He, and, uh, the true story is, you know how he got me to do it, don't you? We're sitting at the third lunch we'd had, and I said, you know, why would I give up my dream job in Kansas City to go to Jefferson City? I'd been there before, right? And to go to Jefferson City and be bean counter with a green eye shade, you know, why would I want to do that? And he goes, well, Claire, you know, both Kit Bond and John Ashcroft were state auditor. I go, okay, I'll do it. <laughs> so ambition comes in handy sometimes. Thank you guys very much. This is fun.